Martin, as we look at the vast scope of human knowledge, particularly in science, some would think that there are basic principles, not just of how we learn things, scientific method, etc., but actual principles that we can see in different levels of the hierarchy of knowledge, from physics to chemistry to biology, even to human systems and sociology, that there are some principles on how the world is, is, is put together, in essence, sitting at the bottom of things. Is that reading too much into a desire for some kind of unity, or, or is there some reality to it? Well, of course, physics is the one subject where we do expect exact theories to be a very good approximation. Uh, that's less so when we get up to complex phenomena. Sure. But, of course, there are some surprising regularities, uh, so-called scaling laws between the uh, um, properties of objects and their size, for instance, and, of course, regularities in the behavior of um, uh, living things. Um, the uh, mathematical law relates to the so-called fractals that determines mm -hmm. the patterns that we see in a whole range of, of plants and also ecological systems, etc. And so I think there are ways in which surprisingly simple mathematics can be applied in a range of scales to biological and even social phenomena. And of course, another important insight uh, comes from the realization that simple um, laws, simple prescriptions can have very complex consequences. I mm, mean, the mm -hmm. most famous classic example is John Conway's Game of Life, where he uh, just devised a, a simple game on a checkerboard uh, where you have very simple rules, but following through those rules, you can get a variety of structures, even reproducing structures. And that's obviously a very interesting metaphor, which does show that you can have complex consequences from very simple laws. And I think this has been uh, an important message. And uh, in ecology, one has learned that uh, simple laws can lead either to random behavior or to a pantechaotic behavior. And this is an important insight in some of those. So I think there are ways in which surprisingly simple mathematics, surprisingly simple laws can have a wide applicability. And this is gratifying. And that's one way in which scientists can provide interdisciplinary insight by showing that there are links between different levels in the hierarchy of complexity. But when people talk about a single scientific method, I get rather cautious because, of course, uh, some sciences involve mathematics, some don't. And if we think of an experimental scientist, um, particularly someone who's doing environmental science, then I don't honestly think there's anything different in the scientific method from what would be followed by, um, say, a detective <laughs> or anyone else in trying to draw inferences from fragmentary and often ambiguous data. I think what a good scientist does is to try and seize on the important clues, decide which is relevant and which isn't. But I don't think they're doing anything very different from what other people do in other walks of life. So I'm skeptical of people who extol a very special scientific method. I don't think there is beyond uh, uh, common sense um, and the sort of deductive skill way of weighing evidence which is used by many other people in different careers. At different levels of science, certainly the applicability of mathematics is different. At the most fundamental mm -hmm. level, it would seem that mathematical equations have a certain, uh, a certain um, absolutism to them. And as you get more complex system, more statistical and probabilistic methods are used so that when one gets to the effectiveness of a drug, you might have thousands of human trials and the difference of 10% or extending someone's life by a few months becomes very valid. So uh, you know, how, how do you see the, the flow of mathematics uh, uh, among the different uh, hierarchies of, of knowledge? When things are complicated, even if we can uh, understand them, that doesn't mean we can predict them. That's true of the weather. It's true of the behavior of animals. Uh, it's certainly true of the response of humans to drugs and things like that. Um, and I think uh, one can explore the options by uh, taking large samples by statistics. And I think an increasing role is being played by computer simulations. Mm -hmm. Certainly in my own subject of astronomy and astrophysics, where we can't obviously do experiments on stars and galaxies, the advances have been hugely beneficial because we have the possibility to do 
experiments in the virtual world of our computer. We can crash galaxies together, see how they form, etc., and compare that with the, the real world. And there are other areas, I think, like maybe uh, drug tests and uh, complex chemistry, where what's now done by experiments, doing lots and lots of options, will eventually be done more rapidly by very powerful computers. So I think computers and computer simulations are going to play a bigger role. For instance, they've almost replaced wind tunnels in testing mm. supersonic plane designs because you have reliable enough programs to actually compute flow patterns in a computer and it's much cheaper than having a real wind tunnel. And that sort of technique is going to take over in more and more areas. So if we talk about simulation, this is a very important area. You've now described it at three different scales. You've described it at the structure of galaxies in the mm -hmm. universe and the, the macro scale of, of wind tunnels, which is sort of our macro world, mm -hmm. and at the world of molecules, which is the creation mm -hmm. and testing of drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that say about the nature of reality if computer simulation is able to be effective at all three of those vastly different levels? Well, computer simulation requires you to be able to specify the laws or an algorithm which applies, and in the case of um, uh, galaxies, it's a combination of gravity and gas dynamics. In the case of wind tunnel, it's just gas dynamics. And in the case of molecules, it's really uh, quantum mechanics and uh, approximations to it on larger scales. So as long as you know the underlying uh, laws, then uh, you can use a computer to do computations which you could not do without it and which you couldn't do analytically. And so it really requires you to understand the underlying laws. And that's why in those three examples you can use computers, whereas you can't yet use a computer to program how an animal will behave, because we don't know the uh, way in which it responds to all the stimuli.